I had, as most of you probably do, that magazines like Discover and Popular Science are for this broad audience, right? Well, it turns out it's 87% um, male and 13% female audience, and the median age is 49 for Sci American and Discover, which I actually found quite shocking. And in discussion with uh, Margaret, who I actually have the honor to work with on the project, um, she said something that I particularly was impressed by, that she used to study physics because she thought it was beautiful. And then she went into writing to, to kind of have a way to express how science impacts our reality, the way we think, the way we live, in a way that we can understand. And the importance of science and beauty and all the dangers it carries uh, is really huge. I shared this with Margaret, and I think there's very few people who are able to articulate this. The way I first came across Margaret was when I was actually doing my PhD, I was given the pearly gates of cyberspace, the history of um, space from Dante to the internet. And um, my colleague, Charlotte Davis, was telling me, oh, you have to meet Margaret. You have to meet Margaret. So here she is. Um, last year, she and her husband, Cameron Allen, completed a film, It's Jim's World, We Just Live in It, about a visionary outsider physicist, James Carter, that she'll talk about. Uh, Carter's work was also the subject of an exhibition that she curated last year at the Santa Monica Museum of Art. And she is currently writing a book about the role of imagination in theoretical physics. So one of my students just said, is that crazy guy going to be here with us tonight? <laughs> I'm afraid not, but Margaret is, and she'll tell us all about him. Welcome, Margaret Wortham. Um, Jim, is, Jim won't be joining us today. He actually lives up in outside of Seattle, and I'll explain more about his life as we go on. But um, he would be delighted to know that he is the subject of a talk at UCLA. The question that I want to begin with here is, what would drive a man with no science training to think that he could succeed where Einstein and Stephen Hawking had failed? That is, what would drive someone to think that they could possibly have a complete and entire theory of reality. Jim Carter is indeed such a man. In 1994, Jim sent out to a select group of the nation's booksellers and to a few dozen um, leading physics departments an announcement about the imminent self-publication of his own book, modestly titled The Other Theory of Physics. Included in each of the packages that he sent was a wall chart, and on one, one side of this chart was his alternative theory of nuclear structure, and on the other side was Jim's alternative theory of the creation of the universe. The book itself that he was telling us about proffered an entire phantasmagorical theory of creation. It was a complete, he was offering a complete picture of the physical world from the subatomic to the intergalactic. And all of this was kind of populated by this strange kind of staccato poetics. Throughout the book were extraordinary diagrams giving graphic weight to his theories. And since then, he's indeed gone on to create a whole body of work of animations of his theories. And we'll be seeing a whole bunch of them um, on the video uh, tonight. In his book, he was presenting such things as negative matter bodies, seven dimensions of time, and something that he called apocalyptic photons, which were individual photons with the energy of an entire galaxy, photons that would be entirely powerful enough to, um, to be a galaxy in their own right. At the nuclear level, he was offering an entire phantasmagorical structure of all of the atomic elements, 
and his own structure ultimately of the periodic table. Included in this kind of model Jim has of nuclear structure were such bizarre things as lithium legs, scandium ears and chromium crosses. To top all of this off was Jim's most bizarre claim of all, that nature's most apparently inexorable force, gravity, simply doesn't exist. Here within this book was a man who had an intellect utterly unburdened by any form of prior authority, an imagination apparently refreed from any kind of restraint. Within this theory, matter, force, space and time had all been subordinated and an entire universe had been brought forth from the void. I was lucky enough in 1994 when Jim sent out this announcement to receive a copy of it uh, through a second-hand book dealer that I used to buy a lot of academic books from. And she had received one of these announcements in the mail. And she was about to heave it directly into the bin when for some reason she thought of me and saved it and gave it to me the next time I was in there. I've never known why Kathleen did think of me, but I'm awfully glad she did. The thing that convinced me that this man was someone I should follow up on was, was in part the fact, obviously, that he was claiming to have an entire theory of reality, which is a very rare phenomena. It's a phenomena that I've come to term outsider science, being a sort of scientifically equivalent of the concept of the outsider artist. I knew about these people from my own time when I myself was a physics student because some of my professors used to receive this stuff in the mail and almost universally they would just throw it straight into the bin. But it, what was extraordinary about Jim Carter is that he wasn't just claiming to have a single idea, which is what usually these people have one idea and they kind of go on about it endlessly. Jim was, Jim was claiming to have an entire work, worked out, very well articulated theory of everything. That in itself was a rare enough phenomenon to pique my interest. But the thing that truly convinced me that I must get in touch with this man was a little yellow order form that came with this announcement. And there were various options at the top of it, and, you know, the, the usual kinds of things. Here is my check for $80 for a copy of your book when it's published, various options for payment, etc. But then at the bottom of the card were two extremely intriguing options. The first one reads, I'm very interested in your theory, but at this point in time, I'm very short of cash. However, the enclosed letter expressing my response to your theory entitles me to a free copy on publication. And the final box on the card simply read, your theory of gravity sucks. So I realized that here was a man who not only had an entire theory of the universe, but he also had a sense of humor. Believe me, this is an extremely rare phenomenon. Jim belongs to an organization called the Natural Philosophy, of, uh, the Natural Philosophy Alliance which is a group of these outsider physicists. Their term for themselves is actually, they call themselves dissident physicists. And I've been to a couple of meetings with him, with these people, and believe me, a sense of humor is a very rare phenomenon among these people. And could I get you to roll the first part of the tape? Jim has now been working on his theory for 30 years. He's uh, in his late 50s now and he's been doing it since he um, was in his early 20s. So the way that he works is that he just continues to think about his physics all the time and he continues to develop it and every single year he publishes new versions of his book. He does the entire thing himself. He's his own, he, he is his own publishing house. And it, it, so each year the book evolves with further and further elaborations. Over the time that I've known him, it's grown from a book that was about 80 pages long to now it's about 300 pages long. And it's full of these extraordinary diagrams of his theories, which are really quite remarkably beautiful things in their own right. And as I said, since uh, over the last few years, he's got into also doing these animations of his theories. It was because of the beauty and the, just, the enormous sort of complexity and range of his imagery that we, I, were, I was invited to curate a show of his work that we had at the Santa Monica Museum because if nothing else, it's an extraordinary body of, of graphic achievement. So there, there are many, many different variations on the book and, and he publishes themselves in these small batches. He'll, he'll like print up 20 and you can buy them on the internet, by the way. He has his own website. 
One of the questions that is interesting is how does a man get to this point and who, what sort of a man might this be who would even begin such a project? Jim has no background in science whatsoever. Indeed, he has no education beyond a single term of college. After finishing high, he knew at high school that he wanted to do science and he thought that he, he should go to college to learn. But after one term at Pacific Lutheran University, which is up outside Seattle in um, Tacoma, he realised that in fact college wasn't for him and that if you wanted to know about something, the idea was not to get experts to tell you about it, but indeed to go and learn how to do it for yourself from scratch. So he realised that this was the approach that he should take with science. So he, did, he left university and instead of pursuing further education, he became a gold miner. And later on, he became an abalone diver. Both of which proved, well actually abalone diving proved to be a very lucrative um, endeavour. Gold mining proved to be a complete dud. <laughs> it cost them far more money to find whatever gold they eventually did find. Today, Jim, he, he grew up outside of Seattle in a place called Enumclaw. He grew up on a farm. And today he has in fact gone back to that area and bought uh, a very beautiful piece of property just a couple of miles away from where he grew up, which he has turned into a trailer park. Yes. He has about 150 full-time residents. It's not a, it's not a short-term trailer park. People actually, you know, they come and they live there for, for years and years. They've had people on the trailer park who've been there for like 20 years. So it actually operates as a kind of little, little community and they do everything themselves. They put in the sewage, they put in the power. Absolutely everything that's done in the trailer park is done um, by the people who live there under Jim's supervision. Jim is a bit of a mechanical genius. He can literally build anything. And so the whole world up there operates as kind of like this, this miniature little fiefdom in which Jim is the kind of benevolent overlord. <laughs> What has all this got to do with physics? Well, it's not necessarily easy to say. But one thing that I would like to sort of show you about Jim's life, and if we could roll the tape again, Anne, is that I think there is a metaphor for the whole of Jim's life, and that is the metaphor of digging. Jim is a mad keen digger in all sorts of ways. And this, in fact, is a cave that is a secret cave he has dug in the wall face of a mountain. He, where his land is is on top of this incredibly beautiful gorge. There's this huge river and waterfall going through the bottom of it and his, his land is perched on top of this. And in the face of this sheer rock cliff, which is about a thousand feet high, he has hand dug a cave. Um, he chiseled the entire thing out by himself and most of the people there don't know it exists. In fact, only his family know it exists and we were allowed to film in it but when we made our documentary. We were not allowed to tell anyone where it was. In this cave, there is hot and cold running water and a working telephone. And when you ask him why does he do this, after he lives in a, in a vast sort of forested space, he's not lacking space or land, why is he carving out more space? he puts forward the theory that he simply likes to dig. He sees digging as a metaphor for life itself. That when you get through digging, digging is hard work, but when you get to the end of it, you can see what you've done. And he actually sees digging as a metaphor for his physics. That he, as he once put it to me, you have to dig away an awful lot of dirt to find those nuggets of gold, but those nuggets of gold are there if only you look for them. So for, in his mind, digging is in a sense a metaphor for everything that he does and he actually spent a fair bit of time digging. Under his house he has also dug a huge room that is about 40 feet long and about 20 foot wide and 14 foot deep. Quite what he's going to do with this other cave-like space, I don't know, but he just seems to get an enormous amount of joy out of digging. And here we have the telephone. Oh, yeah, I'm just about done down here. Uh, I'll, I'll be through in a few minutes. I'll probably be back up there maybe in a half an hour or so. I just got a couple more things to clean and I'll be up. I'm getting kind of hungry. Okay, yep, see you later. Bye. His wife has been intrigued by the digging project. As far as she can tell, the only reason dig Jim does do the digging is, is because he simply likes to dig and she's forever having to ring him up and tell him, ask him when he's coming up to dinner. Um, Jim 
Jim, in a sense, has had a childhood that was not unlike Isaac Newton's in that he grew up on a farm and he spent his childhood carving miniature wooden models of windmills and other contrivances. Jim also grew up loving machinery. He can literally build and fix any kind of machines. He, he happens to love and collect old Chrysler cars and he has about 14 of them sort of grazing like a flock on outside of his house. And, he, and they all run and Jim is eternally tinkering with them and fiddling with them. He possesses a sort of a great love of machinery and he believes that in fact the universe itself is a great machine. Could we roll? And that the way to understand the universe is the way is, is effectively like you would understand a car. That it is a machine and he's, his job, he sees it, is to sort of reverse engineer this machine and find out how the great machine of the cosmos has been put together. Jim basically has three different parts to his theory. There is a theory of nuclear structure, a theory of gravity, and a theory of the creation of the universe. These animations are, demonst uh, are basically, which he created himself, are all models that he has uh, worked out of how the nuclei of atoms behave. And what Jim believes is that, uh, I'm sure everyone in this room basically knows that the, the standard theory of nuclear physics is that the atomic nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons, which are sort of, you know, in an amorphous kind of a ball. And it's the number of these particles that determines whether something's helium or hydrogen or carbon or uranium. Um, Jim believes this is nonsense and that in fact there, there is a mechanical theory of the universe in which all, so the mechanical theory of nuclear structure in which all of um, the nuclear elements are actually built up from these fundamental particles which he calls a circon, which is like a hollow tube. One of them represents hydrogen. Two of them come together and interlock to make helium. Three come together and you get boron. And Jim believes that all of the universe in all of, its in all of its manifestations from the subatomic to the galactic has to be understood in terms of mechanical particles. So effectively what he's done is created this mechanical model, a sort of Lego-like conception of the nucleus. And he believes that this physical structure is, at is actually what's going on at, at the nuclear level. And what's interesting about this sort of particular arrangement that he's found is that it does actually mirror the pattern of the periodic elements up to, up to a very high point. There is one point where there's a discrepancy between his theory and um, the standard theory and he believes that experiments should be done to determine this and that the experimental evidence would of course come down on his side. So in, in effect, what he's developed is a kind of a crystalline conception of the nuclear elements. And could we just roll the next one? He's developed this kind of crystalline structure, if you like, of how the nuclear elements, of the periodic table builds up. And this is a schematic that he's done to show you the build-up of the entire periodic table. And it's kind of like a sort of, I mean, the thing that I love about this is that it's kind of like the growing of an ice crystal. I mean, this is just a schematic representation of what you saw before with those little interlocking rings. But the whole schematic actually follows the pattern of the periodic table and, and these colours are the, are the standard, standard kinds of colours that are used on the actual periodic table. And one of the things that I love about this and that I thought might be of interest to you guys is that Jim is not claiming to be an artist. He's claiming to be a scientist. He believes he has found the true and ultimate theory of reality. But there's an incredible sort of graphic beauty to these images. This is, we, didn't, we, we created this to sort of be shown on television. It's getting a little bit washed out on the big screen, a bit fuzzed. But the, the whole graphic quality of this is something that seems to me to sort of, there is an inner, inner artist in Jim and I asked him about it once and he sort of disavowed any conception that he was consciously an artist but I think on some level he takes a great kind of pride in the graphics and he spends a great deal of time in presenting graphics in a very beautiful and unexpected way and I bought a copy of the book with me and some, some other images which I can pass around later if anybody would like to have a look at them. 
One of the things that Jim believes is that these, these little circlon particles, these hollow tube, these sort of hollow tubes, which he believes make up the nuclear structure, these are in fact forms that are found at all scales of reality. And Jim actually sees them wherever, um, wherever we look in nature, he sees these little, these forms showing up. And we're about to see an animation, sorry, an, a little sequence of, of circlons appearing at nature in all kinds of places. One of the things that Jim does to study the nuclear structure is he needed a structure which would enable him to generate his own circlons and to allow him to sort of do, do experiments with circlons to see how they interact with one another. And what he realised was there's a smoke ring with a circle on. A smoke ring is actually a kind of a hollow tube. So he generates smoke rings and sort of hits them together to see how they behave. And wherever Jim looks, he sees these circlon shaped structures, both in the built world and in the natural world. They appear in the tracks of subatomic particles. They appear in... Um, you can blow circular bubbles. Divers can blow circular bubbles underwater. Dolphins... Um, are seen in, both in the wild and in par, uh, you know, what, marine parks, blowing circular bubbles, and we have these circular-shaped protrusions on the surface of the sun. So Jim believes that the circlon form is basically nature's ultimate form, and that indeed the whole world, the whole universe, can be seen as a kind of symphony of circlons. Mm -hmm. The next major, so the whole circle on nature of, of the universe is something that is primarily expressed in Jim's theory of nuclear physics. The other main peg of his theory is his theory of gravity, which by his own account is by far the most radical of his, the branches of his physics, because essentially, according to Jim, gravity doesn't exist. Since the 19th century, um, or sorry, since the 17th century, we've had a conception of gravity as a kind of invisible force, somehow mysteriously pervading the universe. In the 17th century and, and throughout the 18th century, it was a great mystery how this force arose, what was the nature of this force. We knew we had Newton's law to tell us how it acted, but what was the cause of this force? What was the essence of it, if you like? In the 19th century, Michael Faraday came up with the concept that there was a thing called a gravitational field, which was a kind of invisible, pervasive influence operating throughout the universe. And he, Faraday came up with the idea of fields operating for, elect, for electromagnetism, for gravity. He believed, Faraday believed that ultimately the entire universe was held together by an interlocking mesh of of these invisible fields, which ultimately also must be conceived of as all parts of one ultimate field. This idea, which was considered absurd in the uh, mid-19th century when Faraday first put it forward, has since been accepted as the foundation of contemporary physics. Einstein's theory of general relativity is essentially a field theory of gravity. It's basically a mathematization of the concept of a gravitational field. Jim Carter eschews, basically um, disavows the entire last 150 years of physics and says no field theory is rubbish. That's all just metaphysical nonsense and we must go back to the beliefs of the, of the past, particularly the 19th century, the early 19th century, to see the whole universe as a mechanical, interlocking, physical, physically mechanical structure. So could we roll the tape again, Anne? So what is Jim's theory of gravity? Jim believes that gravity operates, that there is no such thing as gravity, but that what we experience as the force of gravity is simply an artefact of the fact, as he sees it, that the Earth is constantly expanding. Indeed, in Jim's theory, all matter in the universe is continually expanding. Every single particle is continually getting bigger and bigger. And in, so that means that since every, every particle is getting bigger and bigger, the Earth is getting bigger and bigger. This is a simulation of the Earth. And effectively what gravity is, is this. If I drop this pen and I say it falls to the ground, we say in classical physics terms, or in, in standard physics terms, 
that the pen falls because it is being in some sense pulled to the earth by an invisible force of gravity, or if you want to look at it in Einsteinian terms, that it is following a geodesic in space-time. Jin says, no, if I, drop, if I let go of this pen, the pen itself goes nowhere. It simply stays where it is in space. And what happens is that the, earth, the surface of the Earth, because the Earth is expanding, is rushing up to meet it. So it is not, as Jim puts it, it is not that the pen falls down, it is, it is that the Earth falls up. Jim has proposed an experiment that could be done in outer space that would test the difference between his theory and the Einsteinian Newtonian version. However, like all experiments that have to be done in space, I think it costs something like $10,000 a pound to send experiments up on board the space shuttle. So Jim's experiment, which involves a rather heavy piece of equipment, probably has Buckley's chance of ever being tested. Nevertheless, Jim believes that his theory of gravity explains things that the standard theory does not and that he ought to be given a chance to test this theory. We can discuss that as a concept later if anyone would like. The final arm of Jim's theory, as all physics theories must eventually get to, is a theory of creation. How do you bring forth this universe from nothing? Now the standard theory of physics, as I'm sure you all know, proposes that the universe emerged out of an initial singularity, a single cosmic speck in which everything was united and which gradually unfolded to produce the vast complexity that we see today. Could we roll the tape again, Anne? In Jim's theory, there isn't an initial singularity, there's an initial duality. Jim believes, as a great deal of um, his thinking is a kind, is a kind of dualism, but in the beginning, there were these two Ur particles, the, cosmic posi the original primal positive particle and the original primal negative particle. And each of these two particles is endowed with half the mass of the entire universe that we see today. And at some point, what happened in his theory is that these two particles, the positive one and the negative one, came together and he actually talks about it as a kind of cosmic mating and that this cosmic mating produced this doubling where the particles came together and produced four and then eight and then 16. So you get this kind of proliferation where the two extremely heavy, the Ur particles of the positive and the negative, sort of split in a kind of fissioning chain to create all the particles that we see in the universe today. They then proceed to go through this very complicated sequence of changing from uh, protons to photons and there's, a, there's an incredibly complicated series of steps by which we gradually get the full complement of particles that we see today. And then once you get um, the number of particles we've got to, today, then, then his theory of creation proceeds pretty much along the standard lines where you get you know, clumps of them coming together to form galaxies and stars, etc. So it's, it's simply in that very initial phase. How do you get the particles out of nothing where Jim has his own Fizzy Paris theory of creation? So in a sense what Jim has done is invented the circlon, which is a mechanical theory of, nu of nuclear physics. He's invented his theory or his theory of non-gravity, which is effectively a mechanical way of understanding gravity, and then he has brought forth all of his particles from the void. And of course, he doesn't have to bring forth gravity from the void. What he has to do is just simply propose the notion of, of infinite expansion of the matter itself. So he has constructed through his mechanical thinking an entire conceptualization of everything. What I'd like to do now is turn, now that we have some conception of, of what Jim actually says about the world, is, is to try and get some handle on what it might be that, that he is trying to do here. Basically, Jim has, you know, what we uh, in the Australian Anglo word like to think of, we use the term DIY. Do you guys know that? Do it yourself. Basically, Jim has a kind of resolutely do it yourself approach to everything, whether it's digging caves, building his own house, um, having um, 
uh, he has his own little engineering company, which is actually the other way that he supports himself. He, um, he, he, in fact, I should explain that. He, he has two sources of income. One is that he, this trailer park in which he has about 150 people and that, that actually generates a reasonable income each month which has to pay for the running of the trailer park but also gives him and his wife a reasonable income as well. But he, he actually has another form of income which is when he was an abalone diver out here on Catalina, he got very heavy to haul bags, full bags of abalone up from the bottom of the, gra of the water and so he got a bit sick of that. So he started inventing what he, a method for hauling the, the abalone up, which is basically just Archimedes' principle. You take a sack under the water, you fill it with air, and it lifts the material. He started just doing that by basically, you know, stuffing a garbage bag into a duffel bag, filling it with air from the hose of his um, scuba equipment, and, and just this sort of DIY thing, it would lift the abalone up. He now actually has a small engineering company which manufactures these things on a very large scale. He calls them lift bags. And he actually sells them to people like NASA and the US Navy and the Coast Guard. A huge part of their business is selling lift bags to raise sunken boats. But he also gets special commissions from people like NASA who you know, occasionally have to recover um, dropped rocket parts. So he's, he's very much a self-taught man and he, in, in his kind of DIY approach to the world, I think he very much mirrors a 19th century model. And in one of the things I've come to really appreciate about Jim is how much in many ways I think he actually embodies what is the mythical American spirit of do it yourself, build it yourself, make the land work for you. And everything Jim does, he does himself. And that does seem to me to be a kind of mythical American archetype which has sort of almost disappeared. He would never pick up the phone and, and get in an expert. So there is a sense in which I think Jim is very much a 19th century individual. But there's a, I think in terms of his physics and his theorising, he actually really harks back to the 17th century. In the 17th century, as I'm sure many of you know, there was a great desire to reformulate science, to have a new science of nature. Of course, there had been a science of nature in the Middle Ages. It was the Aristotelian science. But in the 17th century, men like Francis Bacon want, began to want to ask new, new questions and have answers to questions that the old Aristotelian science could not formulate, or if it could formulate, seemed very unsatisfactory to people like Bacon. All sorts of new phenomena were being discovered things like spots on the sun and mountains on the moon. Men like Bacon believed that a new scientific understanding of the world was necessary to explain these phenomena. In his book, The New Organon of 1620, Bacon proposed to discard the old Aristotelian philosophy and to build an entirely new science which was specifically based on the physical facts in which speculation was to play no part or very little part. According to Bacon, Aristotelian science, scholastic science, had got totally bogged down in overzealous speculation and what we needed to do was bring our knowledge and our understanding of nature back to the hardcore facts. This is exactly what Jim Carter is proposing. Jim, like many other outsider scientists, believes that 20th century physics has got bogged down in metaphysical speculation these people generally tend to see 20th century physics, particularly quantum mechanics and general relativity, as being, if you like, a stealing of physicists, a stealing of nature by people who speak an arcane language called mathematics. In a way, this can be seen, I believe, as a parallel to the phenomena that in the 17th century, some scholars started to say that all discourse had been stolen by people who spoke an arcane language that was not the language of the common people. That language was Latin. And one of the innovations of people like Galileo was that they started to write in ordinary Italian. Jim Carter and many other outsiders today believe that our understanding of nature should be available to the ordinary common man. Not necessarily, I mean, obviously you have to be educated to a certain point, but they believe that nature ought to be accessible to common sense understanding and to ordinary language. 
and they see that high power theoretical theories based on mathematics which is almost inaccessible to, to anybody who hasn't had you know, 10 years training in higher mathematics. They believe that this is a stealing of nature and that we must, that nature is intrinsically something that should be available to ordinary people. Jim sees himself as someone who is bringing nature back to a common sense understanding and that he believes, like Francis Bacon does, that, that he is grounding nature, that his understanding of nature in physical facts, not in metaphysical arcane speculation. Yet there is a sense in which Jim too cannot necessarily be seen as free of arcane speculation. His theory of creation in particular is an amazingly complex set of se a sequence of steps for which it is hard to see at any particular point what the precise empirical verification of this theory is. And in this sense, I think, Jim, Jim's life and his, the yearning that he has for some kind of holistic theorising is mirroring not so much Francis Bacon, but Bacon's contemporary, Johannes Kepler. Johannes Kepler, as I'm sure most of you know, is the man who is credited with being the first true astrophysicist. He is the person who came up, who um, discovered the laws of planetary motion, which became the foundation for Newton's theory of gravity. But Kepler, who also insisted, like Bacon, that we formulate a new science very much based in the facts, and who in, whose own specific examination of the facts led him to discover these very specific, precise, empirical laws of planetary motion. Kepler too, ultimately, could not help indulging in a kind of overzealous speculation about the world. And I think in this sense we can see in Kepler a model for Jim. The historian Fernand Halen has written a remarkable book um, called The Poetic Structure of the World about the cosmology of Copernicus and Kepler and Fernand Halen makes a point which I think is very applicable to Jim. He says that Kepler realised that although we had to ground our understanding of the world in facts, that Kepler realised that the facts themselves could never entirely um, determine a theory, that facts could constrain a theory, but they couldn't wholly determine it. And the way that Fernand Halen talks about this is he says that Kepler realised that there was an irrevocable play of meaning in the world, that the facts must always be considered, but there were many different ways often to interpret facts, and so that there was always room within the constraints provided by facts for a kind of imaginative play. And that Kepler, he claims, specifically saw science as a rigorous but imaginative form of play. And the ultimate sort of um, product of Kepler's play can be seen in this early model that he produced for what he believed was the structure of the cosmos, which was the sun at the centre of a nested set of the five um, platonic solids. And Kepler all his life, although he realised ultimately that there was some problem with this model, he held on to it as a kind of beautiful crystalline archetypal form that he believed God was somehow playing with the beauty of the platonic solids and using this as a model for the universe. And like Kepler, I think that James Carter, in some sense, sees science as a form of imaginative play. And in his beautiful crystalline model of the atomic elements, I believe that Kepler, so that Carter is behaving like Kepler, that on the one hand he believes he has grounded his work in the empirical observations, but on the other hand, there is a sense in which his imagination can't help but run riot. And as Fernand Halen says about Johannes Kepler, I think we might apply this to James Carter, that in the end, Halen says, for all Kepler's insistence on grounding his theories in facts, that he cannot help but multiplying the supplemental motivations so that in the end he produces a poetics that finally gives rise to an immense hypercodification of the world. Halen says that Kepler's theories ultimately becomes, therefore, 
a huge collection of metaphysical curiosities, a kind of cosmic level wonder camera. And it is precisely in this sort of oxymoronic allure that I think we find the joy of both Kepler's theories and also of James Carter's, that we have at once something that is rigorous but also tremendously playful and joyful. And I think that Jim too embodies these qualities. And so just to finish, I would like to let you hear Jim for himself. There's no one really in charge of physics. It's oh. like there isn't anyone that can, if you send them a new theory and they say, oh, well, this is really good, uh, maybe we should consider this. I mean, there, it's like the people that made the theories are all dead and you can't send your ideas to Einstein anymore. And if you dispute Einstein, then nobody listens to you because everyone thinks that Einstein was right. I'd like to see some place where you could send a theory and they would tell you what was wrong with it. You know, you know they, they, could, they could critique a theory, you know. You could send something and they could let, you know, instead of just ignoring it, they would say, well, because I, I get kind of dissident theories and crackpot theories all the time. You could go on the internet and you could just download one, you know, weird idea after another and they're very easy to pick apart and you know why this doesn't work or that doesn't work or you know you're not aware of this experiment you know there but there isn't any place where you you know where someone could send a theory and, and have it evaluated it's not like there's not a patent office for theories you know if there was a something similar to the patent office i mean you could send your theory in and there'd be some well-educated person there that could just tear it apart or tell you that it's been done or whatever. So Jim is proposing a patent office for theories where we could all, all people like him could send and including insiders could send their theories and have them evaluated. Although in some sense it seems to me that ultimately the great joy of a project like this is perhaps that it doesn't get evaluated. But thank you very much. We have questions for you. Here is the mic. Okay. Hello. Hello. Okay. Like the talking stick. Yeah. Um, that was a fascinating talk, Margaret. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm really sorry I missed the Santa Monica show. Have you thought at all about um, Stephen Wolfram's work yes. in reference to this? You have. Could yes. you comment on similarities and differences? Yes. Um, I have thought a great deal about Wolfram's uh, work in relation to this uh, since Wolfram's book came out about a year ago. Do, does everyone here know who Stephen Wolfram is? I'll, I'll just say it in case anyone doesn't. Stephen Wolfram is a bona fide mathematical genius who got a PhD in um, theoretical physics from Caltech at the age of 19 and who became the, the youngest person ever to win a MacArthur Foundation Genius Award when he was, he was 21. He went on to um, establish a company called Mathematica which makes this uh, uh, mathematical, um, this software that visualises mathematical um, theorems. And, and solves mathematical problems and he's made a lot of money selling this software um, to scientists and engineers and so he's become a fairly wealthy man um, and for the last 20 years he has been running his company and making a great deal of money from it um, and in his spare time he, like Jim, has been developing his own alternative theory of everything. This has been a project that he's had in the works for at least 20 years. Um, and last year he published, it was just about a year ago now, he published a book of his theory um, that, like Jim's book, it's a self-published book, done with a great deal more money than Jim because, as I say, Wolfram's a very wealthy man now. Um, his book is 1,200 pages long. And he too proposes to effectively have a theory of everything based on, like, just as Jim, the fundamental core of Jim's theory of reality is the circlon, Stephen Wolfram has a fundamental idea at the heart of his theory, which is 
a mathematical object called a linear cellular automata. And, and ultimately, Wolfram proposes that from this simple model, he can basically explain everything from the create from the, not the, uh, the structure of space and time, the evolution of life, all the dynamics of fluid flow, the nature of free will. Um, it basically, he, Wolfram claims that he can, through his model, explain everything, um, pretty much everything. And it's, what's interesting is that um, I have, I've been very interested, I've watched very carefully the reception of Wolfram's book since he came out. And the scientific community has paid a great deal of attention because he is, uh, you know, and everyone recognises, he's a genuine mathematical genius. But the scientific community seems to have come to the conclusion largely that basically Wolfram has not got a theory of everything. In fact, he gave a talk at Caltech about a month ago where it's the only time he's ever allowed there to be a response to his work from scientists and there was a panel of leading Caltech scientists who responded to, to, to Wolfram's theory and they basically all pretty much dismissed it. But what has been interesting is that um, Wolfram has been written about extensively. I think the New York Times has done at least half a dozen long stories on him. The book has been reviewed absolutely everywhere. And it's sort of been intriguing to me to see the reception because the fact that he was at one time an insider has given him a platform on which at least to get a hearing. Um, and I'm not suggesting in any way that Jim should necessarily be given the same evaluation by the scientific community as Wolfram. I'm, I'm not suggesting that at all. But the book that I'm writing um, now is, is a book it's going to be called Imagining the World and it's about the role of imagination in theoretical physics um, largely today but I am also going to look um, in part historically particularly to a few people like Michael Faraday and I think Wolfram and Jim both embody a phenomena that, I, that is the heart of what I want to talk about and that is that much of theoretical physics and the, the development of theoretical physics theories take place at a time when there isn't clear-cut empirical validation for the theories. And these people have to believe in their theories until there is some sort of validation. Wolfram clearly, in his own mind, sees his theory demonstrated everywhere he looks, but the majority of the scientific community don't seem to agree with him. Um, he believes he's created a new paradigm shift and the world will ultimately see this. Jim believes the same thing. Michael Faraday believed the same thing and he died before he got to see his theory accepted. Wolfram believes that he, he's hoping very much that he will live to see his theory validated but whether he does or not, he absolutely believes that the world will come on board with this eventually and if it doesn't happen soon, it's because paradigm shifts just, it's hard to change paradigms. So psychologically, I see in Stephen Wolfram exactly the same qualities that I see in Jim Carter. And indeed, in both of them, there is a kind of obsessing about a very specific idea that they have and an ability to see this one single idea everywhere they look. And it seems to me that actually what Wolfram demonstrates in part is a quality... Wolfram demonstrates it in the context of insider physics and Jim demonstrates it in the realm of outsider physics, which is that often scientific, particularly in physics this is, theories come into being in part through the sheer force of the commitment and belief of their inventors. And in my, from what I see, Wolfram and Jim operate at different ends of the spectrum, whereas in some sense Wolfram is the ultimate insider. He's got a MacArthur Foundation Award and a degree from Caltech. He has all the scientific credentials in the world. Jim has none. But they both embody very, very similar psychological and imaginative qualities. And whether either of them are right is something that ultimately only history can tell. And the one quick thing I would add to that is that they both seem to have um, a certain kind of ambivalence about uh, participating in a larger community. Yes. They want acceptance, but they don't want to work within that community. That's a, a very good point, yes. And, and I think there's a sense in which for both of them, 
although they want the acceptance of the community ultimately, they don't actually want to engage. Both of them, I think, are, are to be frank about it, in some sense, frightened of dealing with the community on its own terms. And I see that in Wolfram too. They, they want the acceptance, but they're not actually prepared to engage. And I think they're both actually, in some sense, very protective of, in a sense, not having their theories in some sense, kind of, how they see kind of beaten by the establishment. It's like they've developed this beautiful little hothouse flower and in some sense they're both extremely protective of that flower. Along those same lines, yeah. uh, has Jim ever produced any papers that have been produced in any of the peer-reviewed journals? No, I mean he's written an awful lot of papers. Um, but he has not formally submitted them to peer review journals. He has, at, he has at times sent copies of his work to various physicists, but he's never had any response from them. Has he ever spoken before of the American Physical Society or any of these other groups? No, but I can tell you an interesting story about that. Um, I said before that he belongs to a group called the Natural Philosophy Alliance, which is this group of dissident physicists. Every single year for about 10 years now, they have applied for, um, to the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, to, be, to get what's called a, you know, a stream in the AAAS meetings, to be allowed to have a place within the formal structure of the AAAS meet, annual meeting, to be able to present their theories. And every single year they're turned down and they keep applying every year and each year they're told no, they can't do it. So that, they ha that is the one sort of main attempt they've made to have their papers heard by the physics mainstream and every year, as I say, the AAAS writes back and says no, you can't do it. You know, I've had to review some mm. papers that were offbeat too and the first mm. reaction of one who is familiar in the field is you discard it. Yes. And I wonder, is there a way to, to crack that kind of prejudice right off? Um, it's a, no, I mean, I think it's an, this, is an, this is an extremely difficult um, issue because physicists that I know um, do get this stuff in the mail and, and generally they just take one look of it and, and throw it in the bin. And um, as they say, and I think it's, 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 a, it's a reasonable and a totally legitimate point, they could spend, you know, a famous physicist, somebody like Steven Weinberg, for instance, who gets a lot of this stuff, he could spend his whole time <laughs> evaluating. If he, if he took every one of these that he gets in the mail and tr seriously tried to evaluate, he'd have no time to do anything else. So it does raise very serious issues about how much time people should be asked to spend trying to evaluate theories when, as Carol says, these people are not um, doing it within the context of the, the normative community. Um, but the, the, there is another side to this, is that there are, some, there, are many, there are quite a number of cases in history where people have come from complete outside and done brilliant work. The most famous, the two most famous cases, of course, the great mathematician Ramanujan, who um, was, was a, a man living, who grew up in rural poverty in India, taught himself mathematics and had this very bizarre approach to mathematics and at one point sent his work to three famous English mathematicians, two of whom threw it straight into the bin. And G.H. Hardy, who was about to throw it into, straight into the bin when he received his copy of it and decided that he, he, had, he, he had a little bit of a time over tea break and he thought, well, it looked in, you know, vaguely interesting enough that he'd actually have a little bit more of a look, of, look at it over his morning tea before he chucked it into the, begin, into the bin. And on looking at it over his morning tea, he realised that in fact this guy was a mathematical genius. And he brought Ramanujan over from India and, and Ramanujan you know, is recognised as a mathematical genius who had his own extremely bizarre but absolutely brilliant insights into the nature of mathematics. The other great case, of course, of, of, the, of the premier outsider actually doing something is Einstein. Einstein was... Um, an engineer was trained as an engineer. He was a, he was a, he was a second a lowly second class engineer, working in a patent office. When he came up with the special theory of relativity, he didn't even have a PhD to his name. And in his, in his degree, as I say, it was not in physics but in engineering. 
and lo and behold, he came up with the theory of special relativity. Um, so there are precedents for the notion that somebody uh, who's working from outside the field could actually do something. Obviously, 99.99% .99 of these people probably aren't in that category. How do we adjudicate? How do we judge? Um, how much time should our society give to such people? I personally don't have the answer to that, um, and I'm to a large degree not actually interested in, in trying to formulate an answer to that question. I'm interested in the workings of the imagination as they operate through science. And the question of adjudication is actually something that I think will always be a problem. And there are plenty of people in the mainstream, there are plenty of people, of insiders in science who are coming up with bizarre and strange theories that their colleagues don't accept. Um, and so this becomes and continues to be a problem at every level of the scientific spectrum. For instance, uh, just a very simple case of this, um, is string theory a legitimate scientific theory or not? String theory is the contemporary version, hopeful version of a theory of everything. Um, string theory has never been linked to a single empirical piece of data. It's a proponent of desperately, try desperately seeking empirical validation. But these are some of the top names in physics that are working on these theories. I have friends who are materials physicists and working in such other practical areas of physics who would say straight out that string theory is not science. You call it whatever you like, but they claim it's not science because it does not um, relate, at least in, in any conceivable way, right at this point in time, to empirical validation. So the question of adjudication never ceases, and it doesn't stop at any level of the scientific establishment. Um, and I mean, as Jim, Jim is Jim there? Has, has found out, you know, you, you, Jim's come up with a theory of cells, with an idea that cells scream. Who is he to do that? He's not a, even a biologist. And, and he was told initially by, by biologist colleagues that this was nonsense, and yet they do. There are lots of ideas floating out there that people, even among the insiders, where people will tell you this is nonsense, but then maybe if you test it and see they are or they aren't. So I don't have an easy answer to your question. What interests me is not so much actually the adjudication itself, but the very fact that the borderline between the lunatic, the crazy, the wildly speculative and what ultimately turns out to be true. What interests me is the fact that that, that, is, not a, that is not a clear line, but that it's a, it's a, it's a fuzz. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how does the uh, experiment to disprove gravity work? Sorry? The experiment in space to disprove gravity, how does that work? Oh, yes, Jim, it, it, um, in Jim's theory of gravity, um, you, you, well, imagine, Im, imagine the Earth. It's just a big sphere. In the Newtonian theory of gravity, if you drop the ball to the centre of the Earth, let's say you had bored a hole through the centre of the Earth, the ball would, and you dropped it at the surface of the Earth, it would actually go through the Earth, past the centre, and it would actually come to rest again on the other side. It would, because the momentum... By the time it reached the centre, the momentum would carry it through and then it would come to rest. Basically, you know, the kinetic forces and the, potential, the gravitational potential force would eventually cancel it out only when you got to the other side. So that, you know, that's what the Newtonian and, and relativistic theories of gravity predicts. Jim, according to Jim, if you did such an experiment in his theory, because the, the ball isn't, the thing isn't going anywhere, what would happen is that ultimately... The, it would, it would just, it would, as the Earth expanded, it would eventually come to the centre of the Earth, and then it would just keep expanding. It, as the Earth kept expanding, it would, it would stay at rest in the centre. So he proposes an experiment that would just be a smaller version of that. That you take a large, you know, heavy mass ball with a hole cut through the middle of it, and it drops something in the centre, and, and that it will come to rest in the beginning, not stay. Yes, Jim. Just uh, like a silly question. So, if you were in an airplane, right? Yes. And then, and then you take a kind of, and then you start to fly down, right? So that there's zero gravity. Yes. 
And then you drop the pencil. Yes. And then the pencil remains in the middle of the airplane. Does that fit in with the uh, model of Jim? Because the, the universe is expanding, right? Yes. And the airplane is uh, dropping. Yes. So, how come would it would it, is it doesn't does it fit in? I mean. Yeah, that actually fits in with his theory because, um, see, he doesn't think gravity exists. Mm -hmm. So you don't have, to, there's no such concept of countering it. So in his theory, it wouldn't be going anywhere anyway. So what are, we, are we experiencing an illusion? No, it's not an illusion. I mean, it's happening. The effect. I mean, he's not saying that the, you know, if I drop this pen, that it's not falling. But but the 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 reason. I mean, it's for, on this score, he's right. It's falling relative to the ground. So he he is right in the notion that you can see it as the pen is moving down or the surface of the earth is moving up. That's actually and that score. He's, he's absolutely right. There, there is an argument against Jim's theories of gravity, but... Well, uh, maybe I'm missing something, Margaret, but uh, things expand in proportion to their volume or their mass? Everything expands... You, Kate, you see, Kate is clearly identified. <laughs> If, if things are expanding in proportion to their volume, then it would follow that let us say uh, an airplane would fall much faster than a pen because the airplane is also expanding. And <coughs> if the earth is expanding, the airplane is expanding <laughs> and you'd get a different gravitational constant, which would now wouldn't be constant, but would be variable uh, in proportion to the volume of the object that was supposedly falling. It, it's it not so happen? much a problem. I mean. You've, you've sort of identified the problem, but it's in a slightly different context. Every, it's not so much a problem with what's happening on Earth, because basically the Earth is so much bigger that, that everything in the universe is expanding, you know, the pen. But we're, we're, on a, we're all expanding at the same sort of rate. So on Earth, um, it, it's the, the, real, the problem is not that we don't see things expanding at different rates on the, on the Earth, because we, we, we on Earth can all see ourselves as expanding proportionally to one another. The problem with Jim's, for, with Jim's theory of gravity is really this, that if, if in some sense the rate of if, if the rate, if the expansion of the Earth is what explains gravity, then the expansion of the Earth has to be you know, at a certain rate, which has got to be accelerating, it's got to be an accelerating rate to account for the phenomena of gravity that we actually witness. Human beings happen to have been to one other celestial body and measured the gravity there, and that's the moon. And we know that the gravity of the moon is only a sixth of the gravitational, of the gravitational force of the Earth, which means that according to Jim's theory, the, uh, the moon must be expanding at a different rate to the Earth. So why isn't the moon getting proportionally smaller? And indeed every body, every celestial body, which is a, a different size and therefore can be assumed to have a different amount of gravity, must in his theory be expanding at a different rate and therefore we ought to see the relative size of the cosmological bodies changing with respect to one another. And since we don't observe that, how can that be? Now, I gently once moved in this direction as a question to Jim, and he had an answer to it. He, he, he was a little bit flustered, and I realised that it, it was not a, a direction that I wished to push him in. But he did, his answer to it, after he first of all got a little bit flustered, was that, well, he has these seven dimensions of time and you had to invoke them to understand all of this. And once you've got these seven dimensions of time and you can start, do, you can basically, apparently in Jim's mind, there is much room for play, Kate. If you add another cycle, if you add, exactly, exactly. But, you know, I, I gently pushed, I wanted to see what Jim's response to this question was. But, 
it is ultimately not my desire here to adjudicate his theory. So it, it becomes an issue of epicycle. <laughs> yeah. You indicated that... Oh, sorry. Um, the, the, the epicycle, I think, is interesting yeah. because I kept on thinking of a sort of uh, a, a neuro uh, uh, Ptolemy kind of coming up again. But I'm actually more interested um, in you than him. <laughs> in, in the sense of, Thank I, I, I want to know, um, besides him being outside, what, mm. what's your, I mean, is there some insight that he shared with you that, that made you put him in that place? I, 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 I didn't understand it from the talk. Besides him being an outsider, what is the attraction to you? Well, for, for me, there are, there are many, many attractions to this. Um, one, I mean, there are a lot. One, one of which is, is what I talked about before, that I am completely interested in the functioning and the whole spectrum of the scientific imagination. And I really do think that there is a continuous spectrum between somebody like Einstein and Michael Faraday and Jim Carter. You know, Faraday is a really great case because Faraday proposed the idea of electric and magnetic and gravitational fields in the 1840s. This was considered absolute nonsense in his own time. And Faraday believed that the scientific community would ultimately at least listen to his ideas and, um, and that at least his ideas should be given a hearing and they weren't. And, Fa and Faraday basically died broken hearted because he felt that the scientific community had, it wasn't necessarily that he was demanding acceptance but that he hadn't even been given a, a hearing and it really did break his heart and he became quite bitter at the end of his life because of this. And it was actually, it's a very sad story because just about the time that Faraday died, Maxwell formulated his equation that, that gave legitimacy to Faraday's ideas. And then of course, you know, we have the innovation of Einstein and the general theory of relativity which completely validates the concept of, of the field and, and now of course, we have the notion, you know, physicists are trying to find a unified field theory. So, you know, from Faraday developing his ideas at the time when they were completely unacceptable, they've now become the ultimate insider theory such that Jim Carter can actually rail against this as, as the metaphysical nonsense. So, part of what interests me about this whole phenomenon, and, and I'm not suggesting that Jim is the next Faraday, I'm not suggesting that we should see him in that light. What I am interested in is the ways in which imagination and faith do operate as, dri as driving engines of science. And that Faraday, and indeed Kepler is another great example of it, are people who, who we now look back on and say they were geniuses who founded major new ways of thinking about the world, yet neither of them lived to see validation of that. They had to pursue their idea with just an enormous internal creative energy and commitment and belief and ultimately faith in the face of sort of blank refusal of most of their colleagues to take it on board at all. So I'm interested in that dimension of, of the way that science operates. And Jim I think is a particularly wonderful example of it because he has had no validation from anybody and not only that, I'm the only person he has actually communicated, who has ever actually had a serious discussion with him about his theories. Yet he believes he has come to the total and ultimate theory of reality. And I find that astounding. Um, in a world where most of us give up very quickly our projects and our dreams, if we don't continually get grants and funding and validation from our peers and our colleagues, where we live in a society where sort of the formal accolades of acceptance have come to drive so much, what does drive a man to believe that he has succeeded where 
Stephen Hawking and Einstein have failed. I mean, in a sense, that is for me the fundamental question. What drives a man like that? And could I have a little bit of it too? <laughs> could we all have a little bit? I mean, I can truly tell you, when I started, I've known Jim now for nine years. When I first started this project, when I first encountered him, I thought, oh, this, you know, this is really interesting. You know, he's a sort of an amusing loony. I have come to learn more about life from Jim Carter than from anyone I've ever known. He has changed my life. I have, he has inspired me in ways I wouldn't have believed were possible. It has, he, Jim Carter has his own institute. It's called the Institute for Absolute Notion. It's the institute that, you know, it's his, his formal structure. It's his institutionalisation of himself. I now have started an institute of my own. And it is in large part because of Jim. Because I suddenly, I, I had this realisation one day that Jim, I realised about a year ago that in, particularly in a culture like America, where institutional formalisation and accolades actually mean everything, that you are nothing without an institute. And I spent the year before last thinking, I'm going to have to affiliate myself with some institution because if you want to apply for grants, for instance, if you want any form of recognition in this country, you need institutional foundation and backing. And I thought for a while, how am I going to convince some institute like UCLA or whatever to accept me, somehow let me affiliate with them? And one day I had this revelation based on something Jim said to me. And it was this, hey, I can have an institute too. And so I do. It's, we are having our inaugural lecture next Tuesday night. And our inaugural speaker is a really great mathematician from Harvard who totally understands the point. But Jim inspired me to do that. And I think he's a truly great inspiration. Yeah. One can... Uh understand, I think, that uh, circlonistic, I don't know what the uh, <laughs> uh, explanations might work for uh, uh, understanding the principles of uh, diffraction, which of course is the, the great delineator be, uh, for the uh, du duality theory. Uh, but I, I'm having a little trouble in the back of my mind uh, figuring how uh, uh, one could use uh, uh, these theories uh, for uh, uh, explaining uh, uh, spectroscopy effects and also for uh, uh, orbital mechanics. Uh, yes. The expanding uh, bodies, it would seem that they don't bump into each other. Yes. Um, uh, but generally, uh, the, the, the note, we, we, we can see orbital mechanics. They're, it doesn't, it isn't imagination. Yes, Jim has an entire section of his book devoted to this problem um, and he, 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 he believes, um, and in his book he, as I say he has an entire section, this is actually quite a big part of his theory, how we can explain spectro spectroscopic effects. So. Um, he, he believes that the photon is also a mechanical particle and that what happens is that these, these little circlon rings, that they, you know, a circular ring, it, it kind of breaks open and forms like a little wave, a, a, a little, like, just a single wave. And he believes that photons are literally single waves that interact with the circ these circlon particles. And so he has an entire part of his book, which you're very welcome to take a look at, where he explains all of um, the spectroscopic um, theories, like the Lyman series and the Pashkin Fun series of the spectrum of hydrogen, which is the most studied. Now, it's open to you to decide whether you believe he has or not, but this isn't, that specific question is one that he has gone into at some considerable length. And um, I have to say that it's not entirely easy to work out exactly what Jim is proposing here. But um, you are very welcome to obtain a copy of this book on the internet and assess it for yourself. It's full of excellent diagrams. <laughs>
and many, many equations here. You might like to take a look at a bit of it. Well, basically, uh, what, what about the ideas of orbital mechanics? Do you, do you have some easy explanations here? Uh, well, what, what specific bit of orbital mechanics do you mean? You well, mean the shapes of the Earth, the Earth going around the Sun, the Sun going around the galaxy. Oh, you mean why, why do the planets go around the? Why do the why are the planets set in orbits at all? Is that what you mean? Exactly. Uh, if, you know, we, we we tend to rely on the notion of gravity, or if not uh, gravity in in its uh, older sense, mm -hmm. certainly in the newer senses of the uh, curvature of space. Uh, I, I, but it, uh, it, uh, it isn't real obvious to me that an expanding Earth would cause the moon to go around in a circle. No, it, is, it, it, is, it isn't really obvious, and that is actually not a, not a question that I've heard him ever specifically address. Okay. Um, so, I, the specific mechanics of how, the say, the solar system came to have the precise... Um, form that it has is not a question that to my mind he has specifically addressed and as he says you know there are always more things to explain so in a sense his his ability to continue theorizing never finishes and there there are always more questions he hasn't answered it, he every single question but he believes he's got the basics of the entire theory but there are obviously lots of specific details and that's certainly one that that he hasn't specifically answered yeah. Yes. Uh, you show us a lot of. I'll try and keep this quick. You show, you show us yes. a lot of images of circles, like the sunspots or the traces of the subatomic particles, things like that. Mm. But in every graphic representation of these circlons, they were either bound at 90 degree angles or moving in straight lines. Mm -hmm. does, I mean, how does that translate up to a larger scale if they're only going straight or bound together 90 degrees, which confines a larger structure to 90 degrees? Oh no! Well, he he believes Andrew that those that you know the, the, as you say that those not, that particular crystalline structure that we saw that that's actually what's going on in the nuclei of the atom. So and two atoms will have to bind to make some molecule, right? And yes. If they're all binding at ninety degrees. Unless he's got, I don't, I don't have any of the. It is <laughs> no, I did. I myself once asked him this question because. You know, the tradition, the the standard model, of course, says that the nucleus is effectively like a sphere, yes. um, and in Jim's, it's it's effectively planar. So it does, make, you know, presumably then all interactions, all chemical reactions, effectively have to happen, you know, on a plane. Um, and so, you know, that that does seem to me to be. Um, something of an issue. Um, <laughs> I did, again, gently broach this subject with him once and, um, well, I, I don't see it as my role to kind of push him on these points. But yes, I mean, it would seem to me that <laughs> particularly now that you guys are doing imaging at the molecular and atomic level... I was wondering if he addressed it at all or... Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, he simply presents this structure as this is the way the kit is. Uh, Margaret, thanks for the fascinating Thank story you. of the outside. Um, www.circlon.com. Oh, I'll give you a brochure. <laughs>